afternoon. And thank you again for joining the Superior Health Quality Alliance Roundtable Conversation. My name's Kim Heft. I am joined by my colleagues, Jerry, Janae, um, and Kelsey, and also our very own Jane Lozen. She is gonna be our guest speaker today. I wanna welcome back all of you that have been joining our sessions over the last year. I mean, it's been so long and I appreciate having you all here. And if you're new though to the call, we're really glad to see you here and hope that you'll enjoy future sessions with us. We host this session on the second and fourth Wednesday of the month, which is a 30 to 40 minute educational session. We highlight topics related to COVID-19. We talk about vaccinations and boosters, infection control, and a multiple of other nursing home topics. One thing that I'd like to ask of you is that if there are, there are things that you're struggling with or that you're trying to figure out and you'd like us to talk about it, you can send me a direct message in the Zoom chat or there is a section in the survey. So we have a survey toward the end of this presentation. If you could fill that out, you can add suggestions in the survey. And then we could possibly add it as a topic for a future, uh, for a future session. So Jerry's gonna put the link for the PowerPoint presentation in chat momentarily. Uh, please use that chat box to share any comments, questions, anything that pops into your mind during the presentation, and we'll use that for discussion during the Q&A uh, portion of our presentation. But before we get started with today's topic, we're going to do a quick NHSN up-to-date definition overview. So we are currently in quarter one of 2023 for NHSN reporting requirements. Uh, this consists of the surveillance period through December 26 of 2022, and it goes through March 26 of 2023. And an individual is considered up to date with the COVID-19 vaccines for the purpose of NHSN reporting, if they meet one of the following, following criteria. Either the person has received an updated bivalent booster dose, or they have completed their primary series less than two months ago. Um, just a reminder that updated bivalent, that's the Moderna or the Pfizer boosters, and they target the most recent Omicron subvariants. So it's the BA4 and the BA5. And this was recommended by the CDC on September 2nd of 2022. I put that date out there for you because I've had questions and we've had comments about homes receiving incomplete data for their vaccinations. They don't know, like, is that a monovalent? Is that a bivalent, an extra dose, or what have you? And we um, we were on a call with NHSN and the CDC, and they indicated that for NHSN purposes, you can, if you don't have the correct, you know, if you don't know if it's a monovalent or a bivalent, you can use the guidance that anything after September 2nd of 2022 would be considered the bivalent dose. So I thought that was definitely very helpful. So the monovalent booster, it's just no longer authorized for a booster for people ages 12 years and older. So therefore it's not in the uh, up-to-date requirement anymore. Um, also just note too, that they've made it much simpler too for um, people that are in immuno, immunocompromised. So instead of like extra doses and boosters, the same definition applies to them. Either they received that bivalent booster dose or they completed their primary series less than two months ago. That's all there is to that. So keep this definition in mind when you're completing question number five in your vaccination modules for your healthcare personnel and your residents. And the link that I have on the slide, it is, um, God, it's really good. It's from NHSN and it has 
the up-to-date examples, it had, I mean, up-to-date examples, it has um, guidance on um, up-to-date definitions, just and decision trees, tons of decision trees in there. So it really takes the guesswork out of understanding things such as up-to-date. All right. Well, enough about NHSN. So let's get to our actual uh, topic today. Um, Jane Lozen, she is our very own, a uh, very own QIA, a quality improvement advisor with Superior Health Quality Alliance. Alliance. She's a registered nurse. She has extensive background in mental health, and we are um, really happy to have her here today. So, Jane, I'm going to pass it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Kim. And I want to thank all of you for being on this session and allowing me to talk a little bit about something I'm very passionate about. Um, I do have a long nursing background, the last 20 plus years in behavioral health, but I started out in med surge and my very first nursing healthcare job was as a nursing assistant in a nursing home. So I do have a little experience with nursing homework and I've also done consults along with a collaborating psychiatrist in extended care facilities uh, for mental health issues. So. I wanted to also share with you that when I said I wanted to do this, um, the first title I came up with was Managing Challenging Behaviors. And as I thought more about that and looking at what is at the root of those behaviors, it's really about meeting people's needs. So that's really going to be the focus of this is talking about how do we meet people's needs. And this whole topic, any, every slide, probably every bullet point on every slide could be a day long, a week long seminar. So we are just going to barely scratch the surface, uh, but I hope that you walk away with something that you've learned, something that maybe you already knew, but were reminded of, and perhaps some helpful resources. So our objectives for today are to identify behavioral health needs of residents and common causes of challenging behaviors, describe therapeutic responses to challenging behaviors, and identify some strategies for meeting the behavioral health needs of staff as well. So if we could advance to the next slide, please. So I wanted to start first with the definition of behavioral health, because when I, I'll tell you, when I first got into this field, I thought, what exactly does that mean? Is it mental health? What exactly is it? Well, it covers a number of areas and it's really, and this definition comes right from CMS. It's probably the most, the simplest definition out there. It's the emotional, psychological and social facets of overall health may often be used to refer to mental health, but I really wanna emphasize that it's so much more than that. So if we could go to the next slide, thank you. Um, yeah. So we are gonna talk a little bit about need, starting with needs and challenging behaviors, but before we proceed, I believe Kim has her first polling question. I do, I do. Okay, we have polling question number one. For the audience here, um, do you feel adequately prepared to meet the educational needs of your staff in relationship to resident behavioral health? How does everybody feel out there about that? Yes, no, unsure? Is, did the poll go out? Yes. Okay. Well, Jane, today, I'm not sure if the audience is uh, um, not sure about the question today. So uh, we were just looking to see, you know, what kind of educational 
um, plans do you have out there? Do you have a behavioral specialist come in? Uh, is Do you have your staff development coordinator? I mean, how, how do you engage staff on um, addressing and um, teaching them and education about educational needs? Is that happening in your building? Do you want me to proceed, Kim? Absolutely. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Um, so, although I really wanna focus on meeting needs, we can't really start that conversation of talking about what causes the challenges. So if we could move to the next slide, please. Yep. So there are a lot of causes and uh, issues at the root of any kind of um, behavioral health or behaviors. Uh, oftentimes we refer to those as acting out behaviors, um, but it's really important to start with ruling out a medical cause, a physiological cause, because that can often be at the root of it. And before we can really address um, what's going on, we've really got to find out is, is there a medical cause behind this? Is there something else besides someone acting out, as we often put it? So this, of course, this role would primarily fall on the provider, but it's really important for nursing home staff um, to understand what kinds, of, what kinds of things to look for, how to assess what's going on, and then what to report. So especially if it's a new onset behavior that you haven't seen before, or maybe a new resident that um, you don't know very well, don't really know their history. It's really starting out with that history. Do they have a history of this kind of behavior? What are their vital signs? What's their blood sugar level? What's their oxygen saturation level? Those can often tell you a lot about what's really going on with the person. Other causes, and this can be fairly common, I saw it quite a bit in nursing homes and certainly saw it in the hospitals, was delirium. And that can be caused by a whole number of things. And again, that could, a lecture on delirium could, could uh, be an, a whole topic in itself. Are they withdrawing from some type of substance? Is there any head trauma? Did they just fall? That's something to look at too. Sometimes we don't, we don't always know when somebody falls. I know when I worked in the hospitals, we didn't always see what was going on. Maybe a roommate told us about it. Maybe a housekeeper um, told us about it. Is there an infection? So often we would first start with, do they have a UTI? Something that seems as simple as a UTI can lead to a change in someone's behavior. And sepsis, of course, is a big one. And I, for the last 15 years, worked in inpatient behavioral health units and had um, older adult units in most of those settings. And that was something that sometimes took us by surprise. So there was a patient not just a few years ago that uh, we had on our unit who was already exhibiting some behaviors. She came from an extended care facility um, and she was challenging to redirect, challenging to work with. But one day her behavior was, there were some subtle differences in her behavior. Initially, including myself, we thought, okay, this is kind of what she does. Um, so let's just use our same approaches. But after watching her for a little bit, we realized quickly that something is just not quite right. And those are some of the times you really want to kind of trust your gut when something just doesn't seem quite right, or talk to other people that know the patient or the resident. It could be, again, it may not be that direct care staff. It might be a housekeeper. It might be someone else who's gotten to know that patient. Um, but it did, in fact, that patient was septic, um, was treated successfully, and then was much better. But it was a surprise, honestly, to a lot of us that that's what really what was going on. 
Other issues can be metabolic. Someone whose sodium is very low can also exhibit um, challenging behavior. So those are all things to think about in terms of when someone is exhibiting some challenging behavior, especially something different than their norm. So if we could go to the next slide, please. And then of course, dementia, which I'm sure, you know, that's something very familiar to all of you who work in the nursing home world. Um, again, in dementia, often what is going on is an, is an expression of a need that's not met. So it's really important to kind of narrow that down, find out what is that unmet need? Is it loneliness? Do they need some social contact? And I know in this last couple of years in particular, it's been more challenging to meet that need for social connection. Um, people haven't had their families visit as often as they could. Um, you know all the challenges of that. That's the world you've been working in. But, um, but it's important to understand that that can also impact someone's behavior. Are they bored? Do they just they need something to do? I know it's particularly challenging when someone is who now has dementia was used to being a very busy person. I remember taking care of some people who worked used to work a night shift. And so their, their pattern of activity and sleep and what helped them with boredom may be different than the next person because that's what they were used to. Do they have some need for meaningful activity? And this can be often those meaningful activities relate to past values, interests, beliefs. Um, so it's important to try to find out often through family or asking other people questions if the resident can't tell you directly, what's important to you? Tell me about the things that you did when you were younger, because those can give you clues as to what might help that person. Or are they uncomfortable? And we often think of discomfort in terms of pain, whether they're in pain or not. But think about yourself and what causes you discomfort. Are you cold? Are you itchy? Are you wearing something that's bothering you? Um, are you constipated? that can cause discomfort in ways that we might not necessarily think about. Are you hungry? I remember one of my kids that I would, I would forget too sometimes that the reason she's acting this way is, oh yeah, she's hungry. It's that time of day. Um, but she didn't always necessarily know that that's what was going on or know how to express that to me. So it's looking for those subtle cues. Sometimes it's like being a private detective, trying to whittle it down as to what's going on um, so that you can get at the cause and hopefully what will help. So if we could go to the next slide, please. A few more common causes of challenging behavior, substance use, especially withdrawal. I know in our short-term rehab or units in particular, um, you may see more of this. At least that was the case when I was doing consults on the short-term rehab. Um, just because, you know, when someone has a substance use issue and now they have surgery or they had an accident, now they need rehab. The other issues going on with them didn't change all of a sudden because they now need rehab. So those are things to, to keep in mind too. Are they withdrawing? or are, have we now added another substance that's complicated their issues? And then psychiatric, um, is it a psychosis? Are they manic? Are they anxious? Are they depressed with agitation? We often think in terms of depression as someone who's sad, maybe quiet, isolating. But that's not how everyone exhibits symptoms of depression. It could also, agitation can also be seen in depression. And one point I, I want to make, especially with um, someone with a mental health diagnosis, is that it can be 
fairly easy because I can tell you I've done it myself to think that what's going on with them because you see that diagnosis may have something to do with their psychiatric illness. That's where it's really important to not forget that there could be something medical going on, especially when there's a change um, from what their baseline is. So knowing kind of more about that person is so important. Even anxiety, uh, something that I really didn't understand until I got into the mental health field, even though I'd been a nurse for many years, was panic disorder. And what that can do to someone in terms of behavior if they're having a panic attack. It's somebody who's beyond just anxious, feeling so threatened by the symptoms that they are feeling that safety goes out the window. I have a you know, personal experience with driving in a car with someone who was having a panic attack. I didn't realize that that's what was going on. And they tried to open the door while the car was moving because at that moment, safety was secondary because the most threatening thing to that person at that time was feeling that they were gonna die and suffocate if they didn't get out of that situation. And so being on the road, being in a moving car meant nothing. Fortunately, again, say nothing, everything was ended up okay, but it's just um, try, what I wanna do is just emphasize that sometimes that's what's going on with someone too, um, is a panic attack. And so again, knowing that history, asking them what will help, Asking the person, tell me what's going on. Tell me what you're feeling is so important. Before I go on to the next slide, I know Kim has another question um, before um, I transition a little bit in terms of the topic. Yeah, I'm having... Okay, hang on here just a second. Okay, there we go. I was looking for, I had to go back here. Okay. So yeah, this is going to lead us right into our next topic that I've heard a lot from nursing homes in regards to, you know, COVID-19, trying to keep everybody um, safe, right, from infection, but yet um, having different uh, challenging behaviors and keeping infection control practices in line. So the question is, have you experienced resident behaviors that make it more challenging to maintain infection control practices. How's that been for the audience? Has it been yes, no, or unsure? Are my polling questions working? <laughs> they are, Kim. I see at this point, we've got about 30 responses. Oh, okay. All right. I apologize. My Speaking wow. of infection control, my nose is running. <laughs> okay, let me end the poll and share the results. I'm glad you see that, Kelsey. I'm not seeing that. Oh, okay. So that's interesting. How, does, right. how does the share look? What does it say? Because I'm not seeing it. Oh, I, I can see it if you want me to. Yeah, please. Okay. Just so 97% are saying yes. <laughs> There's no no's, 3% are unsure. All right, this could be an interesting topic for a little okay. bit later on. For so sure. maybe we'll spend a little bit more time on this than, and, and that's fine. Um, and again, I have not worked in a nursing home environment during COVID, but I did work on an inpatient behavioral health unit where many, uh, on an older adult unit where many of the patients who came to us were residents in a nursing home um, and came to us. So. I can speak a little, a bit about the challenges of maintaining infection prevention um, on a unit during COVID. 
and how challenging that was. And even pre-COVID, these kinds of things were challenging in those kind of environments. Now we add to that extra precaution, extra concern, and I don't know that I have all the answers. I know that I don't, but I can tell you a few of the things that helped and then would love to hear you know, if others have ideas. With hand hygiene, we'll start there because that was one of the most challenging. We really discovered that it really, really was not enough to remind people or to tell them to wash their hands. We had to be standing there with the, with the hand sanitizer, ready to squirt it in their hand. I mean, you know, we didn't do it if they weren't voluntary for doing that, but especially in a behavioral health unit where people eat in a communal environment, which I know they do in um, nursing homes as well. It was someone really standing there at the door as people were coming in to sit down to eat with a hand sanitizer pump. May I give you a squirt of hand, of hand sanitizer? And that really went a long way because really to tell people, to remind people, or to even have have it on their at their bedside. It it took more than that. It took a very very proactive um, process to promote hand hygiene. Uh, another one was masking in a behavioral health unit, and you know we couldn't force that, and I'm sure you can't in the nursing home setting either. You want to, you want to encourage it. Um, and most patients wanted to, to do that. They would forget or they were distracted. And what I found to be effective in terms of working one-to-one -one with somebody, again, reminders, signs, all important, but didn't necessarily always solve the problem. It was, you know, patient coming right up to me, wanting to talk to me, mask down around here. I've got mine on. And I said, you know what? I, I really want to hear what you have to say. I would feel better if you would pull, pull your mask up. And I, I realize again, that that doesn't always work. It did work in some situations. So again, it was being very, very proactive after a while with certain people, all it took was a little hint. I didn't even have to interrupt what they were saying to just point to my mask. And it was enough for that person to say, oh yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I've got my mask on now. Um, isolation was another very difficult um, thing to do. Some, especially on, you know, you're already worried about people feeling isolated, socially distant, and now we're asking them to stay in their rooms. And that's where you really want to try activities, frequent contact, even if it's not a long period of time, because I know you, were, you have staffing challenges, you're busy, it's hard to do that. Um, but really important to, to have at least frequent check-ins with that person. And then in just environmental cleaning, you know, people are residents, patients, they're out and about, they're touching things. It was almost having someone assigned to, okay, you're, you're responsible for keeping this desk clean. So that when somebody comes up, starts touching it, wiping their nose, you know, it's constantly, um, it's constant vigilance. But I know that's a challenge. And um, Again, no easy answers, and um, but it's again working individually, understanding um, what that the impact is of that on that person, and then doing your best to try to meet that challenge in a very, very proactive way. So, if we could go to the next slide. So how do, we, how do we respond to some of these behaviors? And I've listed, there's some references here, and then there's some references at the end too with um, some good tips. I think it starts with really a basic understanding and knowing that there's no one size fits all approach 
to any of these situations. Um, it's looking at some environment approaches, which I'm going to go into a little bit more depth on the next slide. And same way with therapeutic communication, I'll go into that a little bit further on the next few slides. But it's also important to look at, is this an immediate issue or is this an ongoing issue? If there is an immediate sudden change in a behavior, the first thing to always think about is safety first. Is this something, is this behavior putting this person in imminent danger? Are they putting someone else in danger? Am I in danger because of their behavior? That of course requires an immediate response and then some follow-up and then some care planning. Or is it an ongoing issue that you could take a little bit more time with getting more input, um, talking to the resident to say, if, if, if they're able, and I know there's many situations where they're not, to say, tell me what's going on when you do this. I want to understand. Tell me what helps you when this is going on. I want to understand. And or enlisting families help, guardians help, other caregivers help. Sometimes the, the best person to help in a situation isn't necessarily the nurse or even the direct care provider. It might be your team member who works in housekeeping, your team member who's um, in dietary, your activities therapy person. It's, it's really important to enlist everyone's help in that, which leads to plan of care. Same thing, really important to get multiple aspects of input into a plan of care and then to share that with the resident. And again, to the extent that they're able to understand. And even if they're not, important for the team to be on the same page and for that care to be communicated as to what works for that person. And that's where team communication is so important. I know, uh, especially on a, on a unit where you're concerned about someone's behavior that could be potentially dangerous to someone, it's communicating those things in a respectful way to other members of the team. That person who works in housekeeping may spend the most time in a room more than someone else. They need to know if there's something in particular to be cautious of and know how to respond and know how to get help. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about environmental approaches and you may try all these things. You may already be doing this. Hopefully there's something that will just remind you that, oh yeah, I didn't really think about that. And then this link to this resource also has some good tips in it. Um, but reducing noise and stimulation, again, to whatever extent possible. Sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes we do have control over it. When I started as a nurse, you know, we used the intercom to call people all the time. Never thought that there could be another way around that. Um, but technology and everything else has advanced so much that um, it really, there's a lot of things that are possible even when we think that they're not. Maybe it's, it's taking that person to a quieter place. Offer choices whenever possible. It's so important to let someone have the, as much sense of control as they can over their environment. If, you, if someone feels they have no control, if you feel like hey, you have no control, how does that make you feel? And the people we care for, it's no different. We're kind of, you know, they, they lose a lot when they're in a nursing home, in the hospital. We, it, it's a lot to lose in terms of control. So as much control as you can safely allow, um, that can go a long ways. Staffing, I know that's a challenge, so I hesitate to even talk about consistency, but as much, again, as possible, consistency in caregiver, someone who knows that person, because that's the person who's going to notice those subtle differences is when it's, it's consistent as much as, as is possible. Addressing needs as quickly as possible. 
And again, I know you are extremely busy. Sometimes it's just, it's acknowledging. I know you, you want such and such, A, B, and C. I'm happy to help you with that. I have something over here I need to take care of. Can you give me 10, 15 minutes? It only takes a few seconds to say that, but sometimes it can go a long ways. Careful selection of room and roommate, again, wherever that's possible, uh, can make a big difference in how someone copes and manages addressing physical discomfort and staff training, which is part of why you know, we asked that first question about how, how do you meet these needs? How will you meet those needs um, for staff training? Next slide, please. And then therapeutic communication. There's some lots and lots of information out there about therapeutic communication, how to go about it, examples, resources, and I listed one here, um, but it really it boils down to a few basics um, that if we follow these, um, you know, there's a lot more, but I have found these to be probably the most important uh, respect, so important. And I think it starts with knowing someone's name and making sure they know who you are. How many times have you been to a doctor's office or somewhere where somebody just walks in the room, they start doing things and you start to want, well, who are you? What, what are you doing? What's your role here? So important to let people know what you're doing, to learn their name. That is unbelievably important to people. That is something I, that really, um, really was, I guess, a, a bit, I shouldn't say surprising, but I just really understood the importance of that working in behavioral health in particular. When you could go onto the unit or you go into your facility and can greet people by name, that's, it's great to say good morning. And if you don't remember somebody's name, I mean, it takes me a while to remember people's names, but when people know your name, that is one of the most personal things to you. I've had many patients over the years look at me surprised, like you remembered my name. You took the time to remember me, remember my name. And it meant, means a lot to people. Giving time. And again, that is probably one of the hardest things to do because we're all busy, right? And you have a lot of tasks to do and a lot of things to do. Um, sometimes it doesn't take a lot of time to mean a lot to someone. It can just be a minute or two. Um, and sometimes that minute or two you take at the beginning um, can prevent other things from happening down the way. Patience. And even if you don't feel patient inside and you know, oh my gosh, I got this list of 20 things to do and they, they, they want my time. And that's where you, you gotta be an actor, an actress sometimes is just, you know what? I'm feeling it inside, but I wanna make sure this person doesn't see it in me. I want them to feel like I've got all the time in the world, even though I don't. Cause sometimes that one minute to you might seem like, um, you don't have it, but that one minute can feel, can just be so important to people. Honesty, being really honest about it. If you really can't do it right now, it's important to be honest. Don't make promises that you can't keep because people will remember that. Um, and compassion, of course, everything we do um, with compassion. Next slide, thank you. And I didn't feel this could not be complete at all without talking about you and your team. Um, I know it's very cliche to talk about, you know, putting on your own oxygen before you help someone else, but it is so true in terms of our well being and our, and our mental health. It is very difficult to care for someone. We can do it, we can push through um, to care for others. But when we have not taken care of ourselves, 
it's going to come out somewhere, even if it doesn't, that frustration, um, your own issues, they're going to, things are going to come out and you're, you're, you will have your own behavioral challenges um, that you need to, you know, that you recognize. So it's really important to care for yourself, to create a culture that supports well-being. Um, I really liked this toolkit through a HRQ that's linked down here, best practices for promoting mental health and emotional well-being among nursing home staff, because it has some really creative ideas. Um, well-being champions. We talk about champions in relation to other things, um, but well-being champions, someone that, who's that kind of that check-in person. Um, I think I've anywhere I've worked, there's, there's that person who brightens up the room when they, when they come in the room. Um, someone to just kind of check in, someone that really notices when other people, someone else is struggling, or just someone to um, be that identified person. Check in boards. There was a good um, picture of that in that toolkit where people could just, you know, kind of look at, it was a, like a stop sign, green, you know, for having a good day, feeling good today, yellow, ooh, yeah. And it's kind of a way to remind yourself to check in with yourself. How am I feeling today? Red, ooh, yeah, that's how I'm feeling today. I don't know how I can do this. That's, that's the time you need to um, go to someone else and say, look, I'm, I'm having a really tough time today. Can you help me through this? Can you keep an eye on me? Can you, you know, take five minutes to, to talk? Wellness huddles, uh, where you kind of check in as a group. How are, how are we doing today? How are we supporting each other? Important to not forget those celebrations and recognition. Celebrations of birthdays and babies and all those fun things and recognizing when other people do a good job. And it can be as simple as just saying, thank you. I really appreciate what you just did. Or, wow, you did a great job at that resident. Um, it doesn't take long to make that verbal recognition. And then open communication, really important for people to be able to, to speak up and to say to someone else, I am having a really hard time today. And then really, you we often talk about, and I know as a, a leader in healthcare, which I was in management for the last um, 20 years, we, there was a lot we needed to do for our team, right? We had to keep our team going. We had to make sure the patients were safe, the residents are safe. And I think there's opportunity for leaders to remember that we're people too. We have to, um, check in with ourselves, but also recognize when we need that person to talk to, we need a moment. Um, we need to do some self-care or to ask someone else to help us out. It's not all about self-care either. Um, self-care is important, but important to let someone else know that you need their help. So those are things to, you know, make sure you recognize. And do you know how to tell when you need something. Are you able to kind of check in with yourself? It's good to kind of stay, take a step back sometimes, do a bit of a self-assessment to say, what do I feel when I'm really tired, when I'm starting to get short fused? And what can I do um, to help myself? There was at a meeting we had yesterday, someone just provided a two minute kind of wellness video. And there are times when we think, well, what I really need right now is a vacation. Well, is it possible right now? Maybe not, but maybe I could take this two minutes to do a little bit of a, a breather, take a little bit of a, a, a break, a mental break. It felt a little bit like a vacation. So when you're real busy, uh, even those two minutes sometimes can be helpful. And the next slide, please. And I love quotes. One of my favorites is this one, because I think it's so important as we look to how to meet people's needs. It's first understanding. So it's seek 
first to understand, then to be understood. So before I can, you know, approach that person and try to help them or direct them, it's really important to understand first where are they coming from? Where's their what's their backstory before I can proceed? Um, so it's it's something that helps me. Um, you may have a quote or something else, something else you tell yourself as a re, as reminders. Um, this just happens to be one of the ones that I like. And we can go to the next slide. I think Kim may have another polling question. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jane. It was a really great uh, presentation. So I want to um, end this uh, and this, your discussion, not the whole discussion, but your discussion here with this last polling question. Um, at what capacity do you have the ability to consult a behavioral health clinician? You know, whether that's a psychiatrist, a psychologist, maybe you have a mental health um, NP. Um, and is this through um, in person? This is actually multiple choice. So maybe you use, um, I mean, more than one answer, multiple choice. So maybe you use in person, telehealth, maybe use both, or do you not even have this service available? Let me know, um, Superior Health Team, when I should end this poll, because for some reason I just have absolute, I just have zeros for participation. So let me know. It looks like, Kim, we still do have responses trickling in. Um, we're up to 27, I'm sorry, 27 responses so far. So I'll give it just another minute and then we can go ahead and close it out. Okay, we will do that. Okay, I'm guessing that I, I can't see it. So are we 50-50 um, with in-person and telehealth? How's it looking? So we getting some last minute votes here. We're sitting at about 75% at in-person, 35% telehealth, and then a handful of folks saying they do not have the service available. So I will go ahead and I can um, just share these results, Kim. I got that part. For some reason, all right. I can't see the numbers. I don't know why, but that's all right. Very nice. I'm really glad to see that so many of you have in-person support in that area, because I know with, with um, behavioral health provider shortages, um, I honestly expected to see it higher on the telehealth side or that is just something that you don't even have right now. So really glad to see in person. So for those of you that, um, for those of you that don't have uh, the service available to them, uh, do you have, are you, I take it, well, of course you would have to run any type of medications through the primary uh, physician or clinician, but how, how are those being managed? Uh, do you have a, a, a certain protocol or a procedure, maybe some form of behavior management committee for residents or that have some um, behaviors that are just really difficult to deal with? I'm curious to know how those are being handled. We used to have a specialist where I used to work where our, where we were really struggling with um, certain people that she would come in and, you know, take a look at this person and do an interview and watch them throughout their day and then give us advice and interventions, which I thought was so helpful. Oh no. Um, uh, yeah, there's frustrations too, isn't there, in regards to the, uh, the, the people that you have to help you with, um, with, with residents that sometimes experience um, unwanted behaviors. Um, where do you go from there? You know, where do you go? Do you try searching for a new service? Does anyone here um, on our, I mean, I know it's Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, but are there any, um, 
recommendations that maybe some of you could pass on to the to our colleagues here. Drop in a couple names of some uh, uh, good people uh, or services that you're using that maybe they could look at. Um, Heidi indicates that her challenge is that our psych company is consistent. Whoa, hold on, it jumped on me. Excuse me for a second. Oh. Or go ahead if somebody else wants to pick that up. I just lost it. Go ahead. Um, I, I can pick it up. Okay, Great. thank you. Thank um, you. Our, our challenge from Heidi, our challenge is that our psych company is um, is consistent, but the provider seeing our residents is not. And then Laura states it was it's been six weeks um, since it has been six weeks once last year, and I didn't receive all the business notes. And I've been emailing his company for three weeks with no response. And Heidi just in response to said that when she said that there was inconsistency, it's almost like they have to establish care every visit, every time it's not consistent in that sense. I wonder, are you seeing a lot of, um, we were we were just talking um, in, about mental health needs with um, not just long-term care services, but other services and uh, different things also that Superior Health does. And long-term care is not alone in regards to needing more mental health experts. Um, it's in all areas, young, old, teens, um, adults, and this isn't, yeah, this isn't good news to see that it's this, it's also happening here in um, long-term care. Is anyone using um, telehealth? And if it if they are, is it effective? I know it's nothing like actually being in person, but when you're really struggling with a behavior or struggling with something, it's better than it's better than nothing, I guess you could say. Is that is that been utilized by some of you? This is Wendy. Can you hear me? I do. Yes, Wendy. Okay. So um, I'm one of the nurse practitioners that does the mental health at my facility. Mm -hmm. okay. So we do use the telehealth also because there's only two of us here and we have, um, well, there's 290 members. We don't see all of them, but we, our struggle is the telehealth has been really good, but we only can use it for those members who don't have dementia that are able to actually relate to the person on the screen. Otherwise, those with dementia have issues, you know, they can't hear, or they wonder what's going on, who this, who's that person. Um, we do have a problem with our, our providers that come. They lots of times want to change um, the medications and not tell anybody, so they're not working well with us sometimes. Some are very good. We do try some things. We do a lot of aromatherapy here and light therapy for depression and try to use the, utilize those non-pharmacological things prior to, you know, prescribing medication or, you know, now with the 14-day trial of medication, doing something like that. But so those are some of the things we use here. And I was going to say, Kim, Heidi also noted that they um, have been using telehealth since COVID. It works. Um, it's just confusing for the residents. And Heidi also noted that um, the company that they use has offered free site consults and appointments for their staff, but their staff, uh, the turnout is zero. There's such a stigma um, associated with it. And just I wanted to get one more, too, from Kelly. She noted that they have a Jerry Psych nurse um, nurse practitioner who works for their local hospital team um, and is very good at communicating with their staff. Um, they respond quickly and are able to come for visits within a few days that they have a consult order. And some more who say that Laura also has telehealth, um, also running into trouble with providers not seeing the, uh, um, Providers not seeing the side effects of the medications that they order. 100% um, of their residents have a mental in illness. And another one, thank you, Heidi. Another one here, same struggles with residents um, with memory impairment here too. Um, we will describe behaviors to the provider, but when they're seeing them via telehealth once a month, they of course aren't exhibiting those behaviors. So. Phew, lots going on. Yeah, I, I, I really interested in our, obviously this is a important issue. 
um, and talk about needs not being met, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, which is sad, not surprising, but, but sad. Um, and stigma is huge with staff. That was a big challenge for me too, working as, as a manager and a director was, you know, we could offer EAP and things like that, but um, rarely um, did I have someone say, yes, I would like that. One of the things we tried was, um, and it depends on whether you have a contracted EAP or another outside service. We had um, someone from EAP come and do a presentation at a staff meeting. So we had a bit of a captive audience because it, it was a mandatory staff meeting, but it gave them some exposure to the information, the person that they might actually be talking to. Um, I think that helped a little bit. It was a start. It was just something we kind of um, got going because they were, we were recognizing a greater and greater need for our staff to have a connection like that, especially, you know, because there were so many traumatic things going on in healthcare, whether it was you had a unexpected um, death or event on your unit or violence, uh, it was really important to, to do some follow up with that person as a leader and then make sure they have resources that they could go to. Well, Jane, thank you again for um, talking with us today. This has been a very engaging session. And um, actually, I'm really excited because um, this is going to continue, um, probably not until maybe June-ish, but I do um, have a speaker that will be joining us that works in nursing homes as, um, as a, a, well, they're a professor, but also works in nursing homes to help um, difficult with difficult behaviors residents kind of like I had said it's not the same person that did it for us but comes in and tries to troubleshoot and she is going to be um, asking all of you for um, examples of people you have so that she can maybe work through a case scenario with um, with you we're going to have two sessions with her this summer so really looking forward to that uh, Jerry, I think someone probably did put the survey in uh, chat, so I appreciate if you could fill that out for us, and if you would like any suggestions for future topics, there's a spot down there for you to fill that in. Um, so with that being said, uh, we will see you in two more weeks here on Wednesday at 1 o'clock Eastern, 12 o'clock Central Time, and we, I believe our topic is about fit testing for the respirators. So I um, hope to see you all then. Thanks again, everyone. And thank you, Jane, for being here. Thank you.